oftentimes the things that uh, I get overly passionate about are not always the things other people do. But let's see how we hold out. Um, they're telling me that we can go until 3.55. So we're going to talk for a little while and then want to engage you guys to hear your questions and thoughts about other organizations you might be involved in, um, in NPN and some of the other organizations we're going to touch on. Uh, and any other questions you have or things that you'd like us to know. So here we go. I'm Nan Barnett. I am the Executive Director of National New Play Network. And I'm joined today by a little bit of a panelist switch up because we like to keep you on your toes here. <laughs> I'll let you introduce yourself and do just a little brief bio since you're not in sure. the program. Uh, hi, I'm Lavina Jadwani. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I'm a freelance director. I'm based in Chicago. Um, and I was really excited to join Nan today because I was part of the first cohort of the National Directors Fellowship, um, which is a fellowship that is through the O'Neill, the National New Play Network, the Kennedy Center, and SDC. Yes? Very Got good. them all. Um, uh, and so I uh, uh, have benefited from uh, getting to know Nan and, uh, and NPN through that. And since then, I have joined uh, the Affiliated Artists Council. Um, uh, I don't know. What else do you want to know? No, I'm I a Virgo. That's a good start. OK. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. I'm Kristen Jackson. I am the Connectivity Director for Woolly Mammoth in Washington, DC. Uh, <laughs> I'm a Leo. <laughs> um, <laughs> also August? August 7th. Ah, 29th. All right. Um, there is an <laughs> affiliated blurb with about me in packet somewhere. Um, but uh, Woolly Mammoth has been a longtime member of NNPN and one of the uh, core members, actually, right. of NNPN. Uh, and I have recently become more involved uh, in some really interesting ways that we'll talk about later. So mm, how many of you are familiar with the network? Yes, no, some? OK, great. So you'll be subjected to my spiel because there are people in here who don't know it. National New Play Network is an alliance of professional not-for-profit theaters across the country, all of whom champion the development, production, and continued life of new works. We have a secondary statement that we use, which is that NNPN is interested in the innovation and implementation of new forms of communica communication between theaters and theater makers. Voila. That's the <laughs> mission statement, at least for the next few months, because we're in the midst of strategic planning. And one of the things that we've learned is that vision statement, the innovation of implement and implementation part, is something that we are actually now doing instead of it being just a part of our vision. And so that's going to be moving up to the top of our mission statement. All that said, what it really means is that we're a group of theaters of all shapes and sizes and missions that have come together around the creation and development of new work and this idea of continued life. And that has manifested itself from the very beginning of the organization. Uh, so 20 years ago, a group of about 10 people came together, most of whom were running small and mid-size theaters, not in New York across the country who were doing new work and were struggling with the fact that they were supporting playwrights local to them or playwrights that they had fallen for and couldn't get enough of. And yet they would have a wonderful, successful opening of a wonderful new play and that was the end of it. That there was no pipeline, there was no system to move those plays across the country if it wasn't coming out of New York. And they knew that there was really great work being done that other communities would be interested in and wanted to be shared. And so they came together to try to find a way to be able to talk to each other on a regular basis and help share that work out. Uh, that group grew slowly. Uh, and by the time it reached about its fifth anniversary, it had begun a program called the National Showcase of New Plays where they were, those theaters, those by that point about 10, 12 companies 
were getting together once a year, and they were bringing a show, a reading, or a fully produced play to show to other people that they thought they might be interested in. Out of that discussion came this idea that when a play was done and ready to be shared, it wasn't always finished. And how might we be able to support a play getting a second production or a third production? How do we break that mold of premiere-itis, uh, that uh, the only good production of a play was its first production? And people wanted to, theaters wanted to be able to lay claim to having the world premiere, and nobody was really interested in doing after that, unless it had had a major New York run. So a group, again, of those people gathered and had a discussion where uh, someone said, well, what if we gave theaters money to basically <laughs> sort of bribe them into doing a second production? Uh, and uh, after a great deal of chatting, I, who was at that point running what was then the largest theater in the United States doing exclusively new and, new and developing work, Florida Stage down in the Palm Beaches, uh, made the famous statement that I didn't think it would be a problem because they would never get three artistic directors to agree on anything. <laughs> so I didn't think we were going to have to worry about raising much money. Mm -hmm. um, luckily, I was ignored. <laughs> And that conversation turned into the NNPN Rolling World Premiere Program. Uh, in that program, a playwright is, once three or more artistic directors agree that they would like to work on the play, NNPN provides support to help them gather the rights, work with the playwright, with their representative, set up the schedule, do the, some shared filling, and in um, many cases actually pay now, it's about $25,000 to be split up amongst three theaters. Um, we provide staff support for coordinated conversations that happen with the artists, with the marketing teams, with the connectivity teams uh, of all the theaters that are working on the play. And the playwright then gets three or more entirely separate and distinct productions in a 12 month period. And NPN now has about 115 members, ranging in size from $50,000 a year budgets up through the big guns, Oregon Shakes and Lincoln Center. Um, and so a playwright has the opportunity to experience that play on its feet in front of audiences in towns big and small, in theaters tiny and magnificent, uh, out of the mouths of actors and in the hands of directors that can vary vastly over the course of the year. The play then, the, we are paying for that playwright to be in residence and work on the play as it moves across the country. So what we've basically done is created a community of these theaters that are not in any way restricted by budget size or location. We have theaters literally from, oh, I guess, Juno to Miami and San Diego to Vermont. Uh, we're in now, I believe it is 37 states and 69 cities. Um, the idea of taking companies that would normally be competitors and turning them into collaborators, encouraging them to work together on the script and many other programs, which we'll talk a little bit more about in the beginning or uh, as we move forward, that um, where we actually, again, pay them to work together. We pay them to come together. There are travel funds. Any theater, core member theater, can have up to $500 a year to go and see any other new work anywhere in the nation. People can get $250 stipends to go to any festival in the country to see and then come back and write a report that's shared with the membership about the work that's being done there. Um, so it's a little tricky, but we've determined that dollars help. Probably more importantly, 
We've provided opportunities for people to come together on a regular basis to talk about new work. We host online chats with artistic directors, managing directors, literary managers, affiliated artists, and associate member theaters. Every other, each of those groups talks every other month. We do monthly pitches where shows that are eligible that people think other people know about go out in communications to bring those people together constantly to be talking about the work that they love, that they think somebody else might love. We'll get those calls of, I found a play, it's really great, I can't do it, but somebody else should know about it. I want somebody else to know about it. So we're providing a space for the work to be shared and made in multiple spaces, thereby raising the profile of both the play and the playwright. So that's the main program. We'll talk a little bit more. You wanna tell us, uh, actually I'm gonna skip to you. Talk a little bit about the connectivity work that you guys have done at Wooly, mm -hmm. which has inspired a huge amount of work to happen within the network and has now become a part of that framework of what the network does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know how many of you have heard about our connectivity program at Wooly. It's what I would call a kind of, I would probably best describe it as a mix of audience engagement um, with like a touch of community engagement and maybe like a touch of audience development, but it primarily lives in an audience engagement space, I would say. Uh, and we started Connectivity, we made up the term in 2009, uh, and it's basically a show-by-show show strategy uh, for thinking about um, for whom will this show be particularly relevant, and how can we deepen the conversation around the plays that we produce. Uh, so part of my job is to constantly be thinking about, okay, what is the kind of civic provocation in the play? Uh, what are the conversations embedded in the play? Who needs to be in the audience um, in order to have an actual meaningful conversation about this play? Uh, and, and that really shapes, um, it shapes the, the way that we select the work that we're going to do. Um, every, every show is kind of its own baby and has its own plan and has its own audience and has its own um, programming surrounding the piece. Uh, and I would say kind of one, of one of the things is as we've, it's still kind of relatively new, right? 2009 wasn't that long ago, I don't think. Um, but over time, um, a number of, of other theaters have used uh, a lot of the travel um, programs that NNPN uh, provides to come and spend time with Wooly uh, and to learn from us about what's working, what's not working, um, how they might be able to kind of infuse our learnings into the work that they're doing um, at their home theater. Uh, and in a way, it's actually that like interconnectedness and that sharing of resources, particularly, I think, in, in um, audience engagement and community engagement where I feel like we're only really now starting to have these like deeper conversations about what it is that we're doing. And even though, ironically, so much of our work is about connecting people, I think that we often find ourselves in these kind of silos ourselves as the administrators. Um, so in that way, that ability to kind of be in these spaces of exchange with other practitioners um, in this community engagement, audience engagement space has been an opportunity not just for you know, folks to come and learn what Wooly is doing, but for me to learn from them what's happening in other parts of the country. Uh, so that has been kind of a beautiful exchange opportunity, so to speak, through NNPN. One of the things that NNPN really loves to tackle is what is that thing 
that everybody in the country is talking about, that every theater is struggling with, that everyone is bitching about. Sorry, Mama, if you're watching. Uh, uh, but no one's really doing anything about. Mm. Those conversations that keep happening, you know, you go to all these convenings and you go to things and everybody's talking about the same thing over and over again and no one's kind of moving forward. And NPN tends to be a doing organization in the sense that we don't always know what the answer is, but we know that doing nothing mm. is not going to create a solution. So we love to try things. We love to pilot things, because when you pilot something, if it goes bad, you've just finished your pilot. Um, but if it goes well, then you've got a great success. You never end up having a failure because of it. So we like to do a lot of these pilot scenarios where we'll take that question, wrestle it to the ground, hopefully, and say, here's one thing that an NPN can do to try to move that forward. Mm -hmm. So for example, the collaboration funds were created exactly for that. Wooly was starting this whole concept about engagement that's different than other way some of the other theaters were engaging. And we wanted to be able to share that. Mixed Blood in Minneapolis, also one of the core members, when they first started doing radical hospitality. Mm -hmm. We did a lot of sharing around that system and many of our theaters now have, are using a modified version of radical hospitality. Um, one of the, the things that we decided we would wrestle at one point was this idea that there weren't really any, and this is 10 years ago, we were along, a, now there's quite a few of these, there were no real embed residencies within the American theater in small and mid-sized companies. Mm -hmm. So we're not talking about internships, and we're not talking about part-time staff jobs. We were talking about taking playwrights initially and then people who were interested in leadership positions within the theater. We term them producer residencies, but they sort of take all different forms. NNPN will, uh, uh, an NNPN member theater and an artist come to us with a proposal. We generally have five to seven of them a year. And then NNPN pays basically a half salary. It's about $15,000 for 10 months. And the idea that the, is that the theater then matches that with either additional work or additional compensation. But that NNPN is providing a salary so that that artist can spend time in that working theater learning about what it means to be in an American theater on a day-to-day -day basis and also uh, infusing that theater with a specific project that they are interested in having but can't cover within their regular staffing. Out of those residencies, which proved hugely successful for people, uh, both at our playwright residencies and the producer residencies and for organizations, uh, developed this idea of there's no way of doing that really with directors in America. So the project that we worked on with the O'Neill that became the National Director uh, uh, Fellowships uh, is kind of, a, again, a, another tweak off of that. You want to talk to them a little bit about how the program works? Yeah, and I think um, trying to remember exactly how many emerging director fellowships I've done. I've done a lot of them. Um, uh, and I've struggled with a lot of them, actually. I don't know that I've told you this, but um, the fellowship I had done right before I committed. So I was in the middle of doing another fellowship, and somebody showed me an article in American Theatre Magazine that was announcing this partnership between the O'Neill and NNPN. And um, I was having a really hard time in the fellowship that I was doing at the time. Uh, I'll be early career as long as there's money in it. Um, uh, because I was feeling like I wasn't getting a lot of individual attention and because even though I'd been really clear in the interview parameters that being a New York director was not like the end goal for me, that still felt like that was built into, that was their idea of success and that that was the trajectory of most of the successful um, participants of that program. And so even though I had said, hi, this is not my goal, I still felt very much pushed towards that trajectory. Um, 
but I decided to apply for the uh, National Directors Fellowship. And something I really, so first of all, uh, new play directors should get to direct, right? Not assist. Um, and there aren't very many fellowships that actually allow you to assist, um, and certainly not at the level that my cohort ended up at. Um, uh, so built into this 18-month program is the idea that there was a cohort of five of us and, um, you know, talk about competitors to colleagues, right? Like five very different people with five very different goals. Um, and because I felt like those goals and those different standards of success we had set for ourselves was just so clear from jump, um, we became a really tight group of colleagues because it was just very clear, oh, the thing that I'm working on is not the thing that you are working on. That's great, how can we lift each other up, right? Because this idea of scarcity, it's Nahal Desai from East West Players like recently pointed out to me that like, oh yeah, the scarcity mentality, like that comes from a colonialist mindset, right? Like there's enough work for all of us. Mm -hmm. So um, we spent this group, this first group of five of us, I mean, we were finding out what the program was because we were the first. Um, we spent about a year getting steeped in new play culture at the O'Neill, at the Kennedy Center, um, attending NNPN convenings. Um, and then the match was um, a, professional a professional hire um, through an NNPN theater at the end. And so what was amazing, I remember sitting down with you in the O'Neill, it was very, very cold in January, <laughs> right? And saying, um, at the time, I was splitting my time between Chicago and um, Ashland, Oregon, spending some time at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. And I was like, Nan, I really need, I'm a nice Midwestern girl. I am tired of all this like back and forth. And I really wanna do a show that like my parents can drive and come see, um, who live in the suburb of Chicago. And um, this is the type of theater that I'm working on. These are the um, questions that I'm interested in asking. Um, and out of that came um, a successful, in my view, uh, match with the Phoenix Theater, which is a core member theater um, in Indianapolis where I directed um, uh, a new play by Seth Rosen who is the artistic director of Interact Theater in Philadelphia, um, called Human Rights. Um, so I got to direct this like sleeper, um, little summer, sleeper summer hit of um, a play about uh, female circumcision, which I would not have uh, done and was so grateful to be able to start that conversation with Indianapolis audiences and felt so supported in starting that conversation in that community because though I was new to town, I was not new to the network, and um, Brian Ponsica there, producing artistic director, I think had such a great sense of the community and, and um, really gave me, I mean, so much trust and so much agency. And the, uh, the, because, right, these amazing collaborations happen because Nan is able to find money for them, the incentive for all of these member theaters to hire my cohort in that first year of the program, not knowing any of us, right? I mean, that's one of the hard things about being a regional director too, right? It's like, how do you get hired if you haven't come to Chicago to see my work? Um, so the incentive for uh, these theaters was that uh, through the collaboration, the O'Neill National Play Network, SDC, Kennedy Center, um, uh, that, uh, that cohort had money to pay for our travel and our director stipend, right? So the incentive for those theaters was, well, hi, we're asking you to, to sure hire somebody whose work you may not have seen, somebody who you've gotten to know through at least two NNPN convenings. Um, but the incentive is, you know, you won't have to pay for that director and you won't have to, to pay to house them. And so uh, I know like for my colleague, Everin Ajkin, uh, was able to go to uh, a theater in Ohio that is really not otherwise able to bring in out of town artists. Right. And, and Everin was so, his skill set was so, specific and I think important to the project that he did with I Call My Brothers, right? right. Um, uh, and like, I have to, I don't wanna speak on behalf of that company, but I have to imagine that they were Thrilled. so grateful to have his specific skill set, which was not local to that community, right? It feels like we're having a lot of conversations today about like, how do I authentically give voice uh, to artists uh, that are not necessarily local to my community, right? And how do I, how do I support that and um, so that then that conversation gets had and that we make conversation connections between that community and the community that already exists in our theater. Um, and at least that for, for me was part of the success of that program. So you see some connecting threads here with what we're doing. It's all about putting the right people together with the right pieces of work. And out of that discussion came the project that I hope all of you are familiar with, but if you're not, I'm about to blow your minds. <laughs> and that is the new play exchange. 
One of the problems that we were all wrestling with in the field was the idea of submissions being closed, mm -hmm. that theaters were either no longer accepting submissions for new work, or they were accepting submissions and never reading them. Uh, literary managers had entire offices made out of furniture of stacks of scripts. Um, and when they needed a play that fit a certain something, there was no way of finding it in that pile. If they didn't already know that writer, then there would be no way of getting to that work. And it seemed foolish to us when we stopped and really looked at it that in the age of electronica, there was no system for being able to access scripts. Mm -hmm. um, through a long process that involved partnerships outside of the network, you've heard a little bit about what we've done with, uh, with uh, O'Neill and Kennedy Center. Um, this project was with uh, LMDA and the Playwrights Center and the Playwrights Foundation and Chicago Dramatist. We began with the great and wonderful support of Doris Duke Charitable Fund and the Mellon Foundation and the National Endowment. Um, about an eight month national tour of going around and sitting in rooms like this and saying, if there was a database of new works, what would you want it to do? Talking to artistic directors, to literary managers, to playwrights, to dramaturgs, to actors, to anybody that might have an idea that they needed to read a script. And out of that came uh, a process of beta testing and in January of uh, 15th of 2015, we launched the new play exchange. We had learned over the course of that year that there really was a need and desire for that. Um, and we set, of course, some goals for ourselves that said, we wanna make this much money and we wanna you know, have this many people at the end of year one, year two, year three. Um, at hour 17 after launch, we surpassed our number goal for the year. Um, now, three years in, there are more than 18,000 plays by living writers in this database. And it's a highly searchable and interactive database with a social media aspect as well. You can go on as a writer and you create your profile. It's your photo, your bio, and a list of your work. And then you upload a play. You may upload a sample, a synopsis, or the full play. And you tag that work with metadata and keywords, things like genre and cast size and that sort of thing, but also what it's about, who it might appeal to. Is it a short or a full length? Is it take four actors or does it take 18 actors? All of this stuff. And then you are sharing that script with the world. And by the world, I mean the world. We now have people from, I think it's 54 countries that are using the database. Then you, then there's a reader platform, which is basically anybody again that might want to read a play. You go in, you can look for a play by a playwright. So you can pull up their name, see everything. You can pull up a play by a title and see that work and in a lot of cases download it to either your own computer or your private library, which lives on the site. But if you are looking for a play and you don't know the name of that play and you don't even know whether that play exists or not, it works like kayak. So if you wanna read a play about global warming by a woman playwright, you can do that. But if you want to read a play about global warming that's by a woman playwright, you want that play to never have been produced. You want it to be two acts. You want it to have six actors, two of whom are over 70 and African American, and you want it to be a comedy. You can do that. <laughs> it's kind of astounding. Um, you also have, there's an opportunities module, so if you are a theater and you want to read 10 minute plays about social justice. You go in, you fill out a little form, you hit click. Everyone who is in that system who has a 10 minute play about social justice gets a note on their phone. It comes up and it says, 
you're eligible for this opportunity. Would you like for us to send them your play? They press yes or no, and that's it. It's gone. You as the theater then get a list of all the plays that meet your criteria. And if you say 10 minute plays about social justice, you don't get 20 minute plays about social justice. You don't get plays that might be about social justice if you held it up through a jail cell and looked at it, a play that doesn't meet the criteria. You get what it is that you are asking for. It also has a contact piece so you can reach out to the playwright. Um, you have a place to take private notes. You have a place to take notes that can be shared. So those of you who run reader competition, we're about to activate a new feature so that you'll be able to gather all the notes from the people who are reading for you through that system. Um, we're still doing 50 to $75,000 uh, a year of new play of development on the site. We're about to roll out a whole big bunch of benefits. Those of you who have uh, college and university affiliations, we're about to be able to be we have a, now an ISBP something address so that uh, college library systems can uh, subscribe to it. That's about to roll out as well. Um, oh, and by the way, it costs $10 a year. So you, as a playwright, it's $10 a year. As a reader, it's $10 a year. And if you want an organizational profile, I'm sorry to say it's $25 a year. Mm -hmm. But that's less than the cost of two scripts from Drama Bookstore. And you have 18,000 scripts that you're available to. Yes? Is there a component of the database that protects new work from being co-opted? Or like when you upload that work, is it already a trademark? How does that actually Right. So basically, once you put the work on, then you are protected. Um, and I will tell you that in the three plus years, we've had one complaint about someone whose 10 minute play got selected and was supposed to get a $20 stipend and they didn't get it. <clears throat> that is, as far as we know, the only problem that we've had with the system. The opposite of that, however, is that we now hear pretty much daily from a playwright saying, I just got a reading. I'm getting a full production. My play just got selected to be in a festival. And from theaters saying, oh, thank God, I, I had to have a forehander, and I just found it. I really needed a piece. I wanted a piece that spoke specifically to my community on this subject. I was able to go in, find it, read it, and give it to my staff, and we're going to produce it. Um, it is having, it is changing in a very real way how theater is shared, discovered, and made in the United States and around the world. We built it with the capacity to switch it over to 15 different languages. Uh, right now it's only in English, but I think we're probably getting, within the next year maybe, we'll start thinking about activating some of those switches. Um, but as I said, there are already plays from around the world on it as well. Um, so, just to, to go back to the idea of community and for us now, for NNPN, community has gone from being those five theaters to those 30 theaters to those 115 theaters to those 300 plus artists who've now been through the program and are a part of the affiliated artist group uh, to now these, uh, it's over 9,000 users on the system for New Play Exchange and over 50 countries around the world. Mm -hmm. So the idea of what community is has changed really drastically for us. And we wanted to be able to just share a little bit about the power of what that can be and how you can come up with solutions for things. I also want to just say, and I see you, I'll come right to you. Uh, we are now in the 20th year. We're in a major strategic planning process now that Kristen is being a part of. Um, you want to talk a little bit about what's happening and what the next big thing might be? <laughs> um, so I think what made me most excited to join and be a part of this strategic planning process was that it began with a day and a half of unpacking systemic racism. Mm -hmm. That is huge, y'all. 
is huge. I don't see organizations all the time who are literally laying the groundwork, right, for um, anti-racist practices to be embedded within the fiber of the work that they're doing. And not just anti-racist practices, right? But we're talking about the entirety of what Edie and I sort of encompasses. So I think that uh, that really holistic approach to thinking about what is, you know, what what is the mission of the organization, what's the vision of the organization is something that is really, really beautiful and really, really necessary. Um, and so for just speaking for me personally, why I'm so excited about this. Um, and I think the other reason why I personally am so excited about this is I think that um, I, I've seen a practice of uh, engage, community engagement folks or audience engagement folks not being in the room when season planning processes happen. And I think that the plays that we produce are part of the engagement work of the institution. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, the folks who are doing your engagement work should be at the table. And not only should they be at the table, we've got to also think about season planning processes that are far more inclusive than they currently are, because we're still practicing a lot of power hoarding and not a lot of power sharing and a lot of uh, determining what someone else needs, right? We've de I've decided what this community needs as opposed to actually re-examining season planning structures and actually speaking to and soliciting feedback from said communities, not just about scripts that we're considering, right? but also about, in general, what are some of the stories that you are, are interested in or want to hear or don't see but need, right? Because the stories that we tell sometimes are literally the difference between life and death for people, right? Some people need this art, our art form, for survival. So like, it's serious business, y'all. So back to NNPN. <laughs> Um, what I, I am really excited about, um, what I'm really excited about is uh, how to think more inclusively around what a new play network is and what is a new play and what are barriers to access um, as we think about also like different um, white cultural norms that we've accepted, like worship of the written word. <laughs> how can we, how, that's just one example, right? But how can we, how can we subvert that um, within a structure like NNPN? Um, those are just, you know, some small examples of the things that I get really excited about. Um, and gosh, what else? We're, we're wrestling with this what's the next big thing question. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I have a feeling that it may go towards audience and community. Mm -hmm. um, we'll see. We'll know more in the next six months. But I think NNPN has spent a lot of time focusing on its theaters and a lot of time focusing on its artists. And it seems to me that the third leg of that stool is very obviously audiences. Mm -hmm. If you have not yet seen it, I want to point you towards the triple play study that was conducted by TDF with NNPN, where we did what amounted to the largest data grab ever in the, I guess, the history of theater in America, of single ticket buyers and how they interact with new work, how they, why they buy, when they buy, how they want to be engaged, who they want to talk to, before the play, after the play, what do they want to know? What is turning them on? What is keeping them coming back? What turns them off and makes them never come back again? Um, it has been published uh, both as a top line report and the full report. And NNPN will be working 
with TDF in the next year to really come out with a, a toolbox that we can give you some really specific steps forward uh, to be able to use that. Another example of partnership. We have about five minutes left. Uh, I'm going to shoot them back. So I had a question about the new play experience. Mm -hmm. um, 16,000 plays. What, how are you using the backside data? Who's writing? The number of women, the number of men, rural, city, black, native, Latinx. And then how are, and are you then uh, targeting for uh, getting voices that aren't in there? Yes, absolutely. Um, we, we tend to run about 50-50 uh, men, women. Uh, it sort of will fluctuate a little bit over the year, 48, 49. Uh, we just did a big push into the Middle Eastern community, uh, working uh, with the MEA group that was formed out of New York to bring in more writers. Uh, Native Voices at the Autry has joined us, uh, and they just did an offer to all the writers that they're working with, where they actually gave them a new play exchange uh, profile for a year. Uh, so we are definitely looking at that data and continuing to encourage uh, and bring more organizations uh, to the table who can bring us the writers that we're seeing because we have requests for it. Uh, same thing, academia, we found out that universities are desperate to do new work, but before this, the only way they had to access that work was after it got published in the Samuel French catalog or the Dramatist catalog. So now they can actually access and find. I say to playwrights all the time, if you want to be a produced playwright, write a play for 20 women under 25. A university <laughs> will do that play. They are desperately seeking that work, especially when it's work that has a social impact that they want to have on their campus. So yes, we're actively seeking, looking at that data on a monthly basis as to who's in there and who's using the system and how we can keep that as diverse as possible. And I'll just follow up with that. In terms of then collaboration maybe with other foundations or other folks to say, hey, we don't have any trans writers, we need a fellowship, or is that also a part of this? Yes, it will be. We're just now, because we're just at the three year mark, we're getting to where we feel like we have a really um, significant amount of data that we can start looking at it. And we're starting to look at the next round of funding that will be going out after before, in order to build out the program. Uh, we just did the International Women's Voices Day project where we had, um, we offered free uh, profiles for um, organizations that wanted to do readings by a play in the week leading up to or immediately after the first anniversary of the Women's March in DC. We had 275 plays that were read around the world, unproduced plays by women. So finding projects and being able to bring together groups of people is a part of that partnership uh, thing that we're gonna be focusing on. I, this is beautiful, thank you so much. Um, just a couple questions about the exchange. Um, the first is that, well, it sounds like you have a really strong analysis, um, and that's so crucial. Um, the idea that a play and an artist could be turned into metadata and searched upon, um, like, leads me down a tokenization rabbit hole mm -hmm. place. Um, and so I'm curious if you have kind of a way to share um, your analysis with the organizations that might be um, using the exchange um, so that they are not right. Googling black lady playwright plus environmental justice and sort of just like shoving, you know, shoving a play into a hole in a season. Because mm -hmm. um, that does like sort of give me pause. And then I also am curious to understand if you have any kind of community guidelines around artist pay um, and remuneration. Um, because as my colleague so rightly pointed out, there are a significant number of IP concerns. Um, and so, I'm, yeah, I'm just sort of curious mm -hmm. because like a resource like this is so critical. A library is a, a beautiful space. Um, and, but one wonders about um, how to create a way of utilizing that library that also shares a deep analysis and a deep respect for the artists. And, 
Um, I'm just super curious to hear your thoughts, like all of y'all's thoughts on that. So there's a randomization part of the um, uh, of the exchange every day. There's a randomly chosen playwright, play, organization, and reader that pop up. You also can all make recommendations at 250 words or less, only positive, and they rotate literally as they are uploaded. There's a, a screen that rolls so that there's exposure for those. There is no adjudication of the scripts in any way, so we don't say what a play is. The playwright themselves does that, sure. um, and so we're not controlling that piece of it. We also don't even say uh, what a playwright is. One of our early successes was a seventh grader who had written a play who got that play produced at a college on the other side of the country because it fit the criteria that they were looking for. So I think uh, we are we are absolutely having those plays be available through those categories because that's the way people search right now. I would love to change that. I, it used to be that I would go in and put in the letter A and see how many plays popped up. You can't really do that anymore. Um, I think the randomization part of it that does work is the opportunities module, mm -hmm. where somebody says, I needed to, uh, you know, a 10 minute play about this, and then they get all of that stuff. So I don't know that we're answering all of your questions now. The, the, the focus has been on making those plays available to everyone sure. in uh, a unadjudicated way. Uh, but it's something, it's a great comment, and I'll take that back to our gang to continue to look at. Do we, are we at time? I'm so sorry. Thank you all so much for joining us today. We're all around if you, for the next few hours, Edith, for the next few hours, Edith, for the next few hours, Edith, for the next few hours, Edith.